Why don't you go to Acts 1 with me? Why don't you go to Acts 1? And I want to introduce my text. Now, I'm, I'm actually, I, on your paper, I've gone 1 through 8, but I'm actually going to go 1 through 11. Okay? And I want you, and I want you to see, I'm going to break this. This is Acts 1 through 11. And I'm going to break it into three sections to show you how uh, Luke laid this out. You know, Luke is the author of Acts. Acts is actually volume two, you know. Okay, here is the first chapter, uh, first chapter, and we're looking at first five verses, and then we're looking at six through eight, and we're looking at nine through 11. There's three sections here that I want to break this down for you to see on my subject matter of Jesus baptizing with the Holy Spirit. He's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit. So he opens this up uh, by saying that, that uh, in, uh, in the first account, uh, and he, he's talking to Theophilus about all that Jesus began to do and teach. In the first account, we're talking about Acts. Well, we're talking about the book of Luke, uh, where, uh, where he discussed all that Jesus did and taught and all of that until... And now this is the reason for the book of Acts. He says, I wrote my first volume. Volume one is the book of Luke. This is the writer who wrote it. And volume two is the book of Acts. That's volume two. Volume one, volume two. And so he says in verse two, until the day... When he was taken up after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. Okay. When you read the book of Luke at the very end, chapter 24, at the very end is where he's picked up. So let's just, let's glance over to Luke for a moment. Let's go to Luke for a moment, show you this. He's picked up volume two where he left off. Volume two. Of Luke's writings, if I never find it. Look at verse 50 through 53. Uh, prior to that, he's been talking about um, verse 49. And behold, I am sending forth the promise of my father upon you, but you are to stay in the city and you are to be clothed with power from on high. Now look at verse, then it goes. And, and if, you're, if you have a study Bible, they're probably going to show you the ascension, Right? They're going to say the ascension. And he had led, and he led them out as far as Bethany, and then he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came about that while he was blessing them, he, he, he parted from them, and they returned. In other words, he left. He, he ascended. And they returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continued in the temple praising God. This is where he's picked up. He has picked up that subject until the day when he was taken up, See, I wrote in my first, my first account, my first volume, until the day when he was taken up after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these, he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs appearing to them over a period of 40 days. Post, that's post-resurrection appearances. And speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. And gathering together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem. See, that's, we're still picking up all from Luke. But to wait for what the Father had promised, which he, now watch this, which you heard of from me. For John, see, now we're back to Matthew, um, third chapter, or in Luke, we're in the third chapter. But in Matthew, we're in the third chapter. John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then he adds a phrase that we have not seen before. Not many days from now, this is his, he's talking about his ascension. They're going to receive this promise, him baptizing with the Holy Spirit, not many days after his ascension. Okay? Now we got verses 6 through 8. So, and, and look, before I leave this, look, look at all the, 
here's what you miss when you read through this. L look at the things until the day after he has, is it until the day when and he, he goes back, after he had, uh, by the Holy Spirit, given orders about this, of 40 days of post-resurrection appearances, wait for the promise. See, all those are key ideas, and I've only read five verses, but those are all key ideas. Now, verses 6 through 8. And so when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? Now, now let me pause a minute. I'm almost getting ready to preach here, and I'm trying to do an introduction. But I want you to stop, and I want you to get something. I want you to get something, because you're, you're like, and I'm like these disciples. We've got enough information to be dangerous. We've got enough biblical information to be dangerous. Here's what they're doing. They've got to stop. They've got, they've got to stop running their own agenda on what they think the Bible is saying when they don't know. They think they know, but they don't. For example, what is the agenda that these disciples are pushing, have been pushing ever since he started talking about this? They're pushing, and they, and they really believe this, and, and they're missing what he's teaching because of the importance of it to their life. They're missing it. Because their agenda, agenda is they believe that the Messiah has come and there's only one coming. And, his, and the whole shoot match is going to roll out. Because in the Old Testament, they didn't teach a first and second coming. They just taught the coming of the Messiah. What is unique is between the first coming and second coming is the church age, which is the mystery. They didn't know that. I don't fault them for that, but they're pushing an agenda that he keeps pushing back on, said, no, guys, you're misunderstanding this. Now, listen to what he says to them, because, listen, they've come in with an agenda, a, a scriptural agenda they, that they, they believe they're right about in the Bible. These guys are not making up stuff. They believe they have what the Bible has taught them, but they've misunderstood the unfolding. Here's what they've uh, missed. That when Christ would come, there would be the unfolding of the plan of God. Okay? And it would be different than what they thought. And here's how he clears it up. I, here's what he says that would clear it up. I don't think it did, but here's what he said. He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. They're trying to fit their agenda into the unfolding of the messianic program. Listen, we, we do it on the second coming. We do it on the second coming. And he, he clearly tells you, you don't know. Even the son doesn't know. You do not know the time. We, 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 do, we tend to do the same type of things. But listen what he says. He said, look, put that aside because you're missing Bible study by having some kind of an agenda that you don't, that you've misunderstood. It's not that you don't understand, you've misunderstood. Lay it aside. And he tells them this, you don't know the times nor the epochs which the Father has fixed by his own sovereign authority. So he comes back to his subject. Listen, get off that. Set your agenda aside because you're mistaken. Set it aside. I want to teach you the truth. And so he comes to verse 8. He says, but you shall receive power. Now he's back to his, this is what he's been trying to teach him all the time. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Actually, that's going to become an important, I can't tell you how important this is. That's a very important layout of time and epics of him baptizing with the Holy Spirit. Because there's going to be four of them in the book of Acts. Now, verses 9, 10, and 11. And after he said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on him, and a cloud received him out of their sight. That's the ascension. And he says, 
you, this is what I'm telling you is not going to come to, to be except for a few days. Remember, remember verse 5? But in a few days, it will start coming to pass. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was departing, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. He will come in just the same way. Okay? Now, we look for him. We believe that. We, we are looking for that. Well, we don't know the time of the epics. Any more than... And listen, you get, get caught up in all that kind of stuff that he says don't get caught up and you're going to miss the, the reality of the doctrine that ought to be working in your life today. See? So that's the, that's the point of the first 11 verses. My subject comes off verse 5. Let's go back to verse 5. For John baptized you with water. But you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. That's something new that he's added to this. That's, that's something new. Not many days from now. And we know that that's going to be Pentecost. Okay? Not many days. That's going to be 10 days. Something like 10 days. So, we've looked at Acts 1, 1 through 11. What is interesting, the reason I did last week's lesson before I did today's, is what is interesting, at least to me, is that the Holy Spirit introduced the advent of Jesus Christ in the world at the beginning, right? Virgin birth and all that business. That's why I showed you those six great things that the Holy Spirit was engaged in. And on the backside of this, when G before Jesus leaves there, he introduces the advent of the Holy Spirit. I just find it. Third member introduces him. The second member introduces the third. I find that interesting. And he did that with great clarity in the upper room discourse. Now I want to look at uh, four things tonight about what, what was the purpose of, the bab of Jesus baptizing with the Holy Spirit. And Luke is the one that tells you. I mean, Luke laid this thing out in the book of Acts. And listen to me now. It was the formation of the church on earth. That's what it's about. So I'm going to show you this tonight. This is the key to understanding Jesus' baptizing of the Holy Spirit with the, with the Holy Spirit. Point number one. There's an important link, and that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ to the ministry of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. I'm sorry. Oh, prayer. That'd be very good. Thank you. I knew my engine got started going. Let's pray. <laughs> Give you a moment of silence as a believer priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit. Confession of sin is necessary for protocol. I call it classroom etiquette. Can't study the Bible in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins. It could be sins of the tongue. It could be overt mental sins of the tongue. How do you deal with it? First John 1 John 1.9, you confess your sin. It, you're a priest. First Peter 2 says you're a priest. This is the new covenant. You're in the new covenant. Every believer is a priest. Part of the royal priesthood. And part of that is your responsibility and confession of sin. And the work, work for sin has been done. Christ on the cross. This is about sanctification, not salvation. You confess your sin for sanctification, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and the teaching hour. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, how thankful we are for this promise. How thankful we are for the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We live in one of the most unique periods of human history identified in the Bible. There is never going to be another period like this one. And, and, and we've been fully equipped to do the work set before us, greater works. 
I pray, Father, we would be armed, geared up, ready to go. On every day's notice. Always living on call. Jesus had to remind Peter, you're always on call. What did I call you to do? Stay on that call. I pray that be true in each of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, there's an, an important link between the resurrection of Christ and his baptizing of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Okay? An important link. The first link is that he was raised on first fruits. That's a Jewish holiday. And it occurs in the Feast of Unleavened Bread. You can read about it in Leviticus 23. Fifty days from first, first fruits is Pentecost. Jesus was raised on first fruits. That's Sunday. He was in the grave Thursday, Friday, Saturday, out on Sunday. On Sunday, they discovered the tomb was empty. That's first fruits. First fruits always occurred in the week of unleavened bread after the weekly Sabbath. And they counted down 50 days to Pentecost, and that's another Jewish festival. The first 40 days from the resurrection, death, burial, resurrection, 50 days, he's into 40 of them. He's in post-resurrection appearances 40 days. Now, why did they talk about why 40 days? It's because we're, the goal is 50. He said, I'm going back. And he went back on the 40th, right? According to Acts. I just read it. He went back to be seated at the right hand of God, Father in heaven. We have 10 days. He said, not many days from now, I will baptize with the Holy Spirit, right? Okay, so you see there is a link between first fruits and Pentecost because that's when it's going to happen, Pentecost. Are you with me? Yeah. Okay, that would be important. Do you see the link? Do you see there is a link between the resurrection and Pentecost? Do you see that? Okay, let me show you the second link. The second link is on your paper, and it is Romans 8, 11. Okay? Here's the second link that's important. If, first class condition is true, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he's talking about the Holy Spirit, and he does. He does if you believe the gospel. He who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal body through his spirit. That's a capital A, S. Who dwells in you. See the link? Here is the link that raised Jesus from the dead. Okay? We're going to have Pentecost over here. And when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to baptize every person into two things. When he comes... He's going to indwell you, which is one of eight works of the Holy Spirit to point of salvation. He's going to indwell you. And then there's more to come from that. See, there's, there's two important links. The resurrection of Christ on first fruits to Pentecost. And both of them involve the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is going to be part of the package of the Holy Spirit coming. That's going to be able, he's going to indwell every church age believer when you believe that Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead. When you believe that, you are saved by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You are, you are placed into Christ. You are placed into the church. And you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. You understand that? Well, you need to pick up one of those little pamphlets that says the 50 things that you receive at salvation in that pack, pack, and we have them. They're free around here. There's some on the back table. Be sure to pick one up. You're going to see that it, because we live in the new covenant of the church age, the moment you believe, you receive eight works of the Holy Spirit. 
One is he indwells you. Two is that he baptizes you. The Holy Spirit does. I'm not talking about the Holy Spirit baptism. I'm talking about Jesus baptizing with the Holy Spirit. These are two different things. They're not the same thing. Theologically, they're not the same thing. But there is a great link here between Jesus being raised from the dead and the Holy Spirit coming back. There is the link. That's all right. That's okay. In Romans 8, 11, the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. Okay. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not going to occur until Jesus' baptism with the Holy Spirit occurs. When this occurs, then this will occur. And I'm going to show that to you. That's why people just, they don't study this stuff, and there's great confusion. There should be no confusion about the great ministry of the Holy Spirit in the church age, and there's all kinds of confusion about it. It just amazes me. Jesus' baptism of the Holy Spirit will begin, listen to me now, when he sets in session in heaven. If he's got to go back and be seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven before any of this can occur. None of that can occur until that happens. All right? And when it does, when he is seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven, then the whole great ministry of the Holy Spirit into the world church world is going to be phenomenal. Now, in John 16, we've, we have studied this recently, but let's go back. In John 16, John 16, what I got, 17, I got verse 7 and 8. You know, we're in an upper room discourse where he lays this whole deal out about the ministry of the Holy Spirit when he comes. It's all about the ministry he's talking in the upper room is about when he comes. He's not going to come until Jesus sends him. All right, listen to, listen to this. I tell you the truth. There's one of our very, very, I say to you business. I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. That's a pretty phenomenal idea in itself. For if I do not go away, the helper, the paracletus, because this up here is all about the paracletus ministry down here. Here is the paracletus, and this ministry, until he does this, this ministry, the paracletus ministry is not going to occur. That's what he's telling you. It, it, it's to your advantage I go away, because if I don't go away, the Holy Spirit won't come. See? It's to our advantage that Jesus is not here. The Holy Spirit is to do the work of God. The helper, the paracletus, shall not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. Do you see that? And he, when he comes, is now, now we have this paracletus ministry. When he comes, that's what all of this upper room discourse was about. And for the next 40 days after his resurrection, that's what he's been teaching. He is pounded, pounded, and pounded. And he called it the promise of the Father. Right? Okay. Uh, all right. The resurrection of Christ from the dead by the Holy Spirit carried with it the promise to every church age believer of the indwelling Holy Spirit. The indwelling will occur because of Jesus' baptism of the Holy Spirit, right? If he doesn't go back and do that, then this doesn't occur. When I go back, I will send, right? right. Yeah. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit is one of eight ministries of the Holy Spirit under the new covenant that is given at the moment of grace salvation. You can pick this up off, or doc, off from doctrinalstudies.com. Look for 50 things you can do a study of it. One of the eight is baptism by the Holy Spirit. This is not the same thing as Jesus baptizing with the Holy Spirit. Okay? There's, that's the difference between the second member of the Godhead and the third member of the Godhead baptizing. Just as he said he would do in Acts 1, 4, and 5. 
Here's the second point. The key doctrine connected to Jesus' baptism of the Holy Spirit is covered in the book of Acts. It is covered by the formation of the church beginning at Pentecost. Once you see that out of the book of Acts, this is dynamic for you understanding the ba Jesus baptizing with the Holy Spirit. The reason many people don't get this is because many students forget, not that they didn't know, they forget that Acts is volume one of Luke's writing of canonized scripture. I mean, at volume two. Acts is volume two. The book of Luke is volume one. I showed that you, to you in my introduction. When you read the book of Acts, you discover Jesus' baptism of the Holy Spirit involves incorporating believers into the church as the body of Christ in the world. Now, you, we walk around and everybody talks about the church today because it is the phenomena of our age. That was not true until Jesus ascended back to the Father, did his so that the Holy Spirit could come and do his. This was not a phenomenon as it is today. Everybody talks about where you're going on Sunday. I'm going to church. You know, the word ecclesia means assembly. Doesn't mean church, means assembly. It became known as the church. The word is assembly. And you see it clearly in the book of Acts, how the assembly became the church. I don't want you to miss this. This is dynamite stuff. Look, in Acts 1.8, in Acts 1.8, he laid it out. We're going to start with the Jews. We're going to go to the Samaritans. We're going to go to the Gentiles. We're going to the ends of the earth. It's exactly what he did in the book of Acts. In, in, in incorporating incorporating believers, people bo that became believers during the Jewish age, you know, while he was on earth. The first, first was picked up were Jews. Jewish believers assembled. The Jewish believers who were assembled came into the church of Jesus Christ first in Acts 115. In Acts 115, we have 120 of them gathered. They're going to be incorporated first. That, that first little group of people is going to be of Jews. When you read the second chapter, verse 41, to this group is going to be added. See, you find the word added is going to be added 3,000 people to that group. And in the second chapter, uh, verse 47, they're going to be added daily to this group until we get to J Acts 4.4, this Jewish group of believers incorporated into the church is going to grow to 5,000 people. You know how that's happening? They're preaching the gospel and they're being incorporated by the Holy Spirit baptizing them into the church. You know why all that's happening? Because Jesus, when he came back, got back, established this principle and put it into force. Point three. You see, I'm in the fourth chapter, right? And in the book of Acts, I've walked us up to the fourth chapter. It's all about Jews. And it's, not, it's, it's picking them up, right? We're picking up Jews. We're picking them up, right? And we're incorporating them into the church. Here's Jesus back in heaven, seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. And he has established, Jesus had baptized with the Holy Spirit. He has established, I'm sending the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. We're in, the whole deal is incorporating the body of Christ in the church. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, the first thing the baptism of the Holy Spirit does is Galatians 3.27. Let me go ahead and do that. So 
we can understand what's going on as I pound out this up. Here we are, Galatians. This is what's established in the book of Acts. It becomes norm and standard now in our life. 327. For all of you, I mean Galatians 327, for all of you who were baptized into Christ, he baptized the Holy Spirit at the point of salvation today, baptized you into Christ. When he seated back to have the Father, part of the baptism of Jesus Christ was to establish the Holy Spirit in the world, incorporating people into the church. The first group that was picked up were Jews. They are baptized into Christ. Are you with me? Baptized into position in Christ. And at the same time, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Go to 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Back it up to 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. For by one spirit, Holy Spirit, we were all baptized into one body. That's the church. If you go on in 1 Corinthians 12 and you start reading verses 12 through 27, you will see that this one body is the body of Christ, the church in the world. It's the church in the world. You understand that? Verse 13, see, for by one spirit, one Holy Spirit, we are all baptized. This is the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ in Galatians, into the body of Christ, the church, in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, whether Jew or Gentile, Greek, whether slave or free, we were all, to, all made to drink of one spirit. Then he goes on to talk about this one body. Are you with me? So, you, he baptizes you into Christ, and he baptizes you into the church. Are you with me? That He says, I've got to go back, and when I go back, this is going to be Jesus' baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to send the Spirit, and he's going to do this. In the book of Acts, it shows you that there was a process. And he laid the blueprint of that process out in Acts 1.8. There's going to be a process. First, the Jew, right? Then the second one, according to the Acts 1:8, is going to be Samaritans, and the third is going to be the Jew, uh, going to be the Gentiles, right? To the uttermost parts of the earth. This principle, Jew, Samaritan, Gentiles, incorporating into the body of Christ, is going to go on. It's going to spread to the ends of the earth. This concept is going to be spread to the ends of the earth. Uh, that's why we're in Alabama, and we can go like, whoa. Amen. So when you study the book of Acts, you pay attention to four groups being incorporated into the church in the world. First, the Jews in Acts 2, the Samaritans in Acts 8, the Gentiles in Acts 10 and 11, and finally, the dispersed disciples of John the Baptist in Acts 19. And reason, and you, and you need to do the study of this because you're going to see that what happened at Pentecost to identify a group being incorporated into the church, the signs of it were identical. They're going to, they're going to, they're going to have evidence of speaking in tongues of the evidence of the Holy Spirit. You're going to see the signs of it. these four. You just go study. You're going to see identity of it and that identity is Jesus baptizing with the Holy Spirit picking up because listen you're in transition period change of covenants change of dispensations a change in priesthood I mean there are 10 major changes change from a Levitical system over to a royal priesthood system that all of this is going on in the period that the book of Acts is talking about. And he picks up, he picks up dispersed, persecuted disciples of John out in Ephesus. In the uttermost parts of the earth, he picks up disciples of John at Ephesus. In, in Acts, when we're in Acts 19, we're on the third missionary trip of Paul.
And he's still picking up people and putting them into the church. Do you understand that? It, it, it's a... Tell me how many times you would have to study this to even get an inkling of it. Tell me how many times you would have to study this to get an inkling of it. I don't care how smart you are. Because it's built on spiritual IQ. <laughs> okay. Okay. Maybe. But I tell you, not less than three. Not less than three. You will never get this. And this is a major piece of your life Do you live in the church age are you in a church it's a major piece of information listen when Paul was sent on his first missionary trip in Acts 13 and 14 you know where he was sent from Antioch of Syria because there's two Antioch Antioch of Syria you know where he, where he was sent from? There? From there? A group of Antioch Gentile believers. You know what they considered themselves? A church. It was at this place where they were first called Christians. It was this little Gentile church. made up of Jews and Gentiles and Samaritans, a mixed racial group of people where that racial boundary had been destroyed by the baptism of the Holy Spirit in Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile. There is neither male nor female. All that business is out the door. I left my denomination because they wouldn't accept that. And I didn't want to stand and fight. So I went, I went independent. They wouldn't, they wouldn't accept that. They would not accept Galatians 3.27. Oh, they would accept Jew and Gentile. They wouldn't accept white and black. I was out winning people to Christ. They wouldn't let them in. So I stayed with the, my people. Thank God we're not there anymore. We've never been there in this church, or I wouldn't be a part of it. I tell you, I would not be a part of it. I fought like crazy against it. I wouldn't put up with that in a minute. It wouldn't be part of my ministry. This little church at Antioch was a magnificent little church. Thus, it is obvious that even before Acts 19, when he picks up the dispersed disciples of John the Baptist, that the ecclesia, the assembly of believers, is now commonly referred to as the church. This word used to be called the assembly. It's now called the church. Listen, it already had that identity in Acts 13 and 14. But it is common now. By the time Paul is on his third missionary trip, it is common. The ecclesia is now called the church. Listen, when you do church history, they start right you out there. They don't tell you where it came from. They just start. And that's okay with me. Ecclesiology is the study of the church, the church doctrines. It's wonderful. Here's my fourth and final point. We may get out early tonight. Maybe you can go home and study. What was happening in the book of Acts was Jesus' baptism of the Holy Spirit incorporating 
Jewish age believers of all different racial backgrounds and makeups, right? Into the new covenant church in the world. And so we are. I, I gave you some passages of a good read for you. For example, Ephesians 1. I love this book of Ephesians. It's a hard read and it's certainly a hard translation. Ephesians 1, 20 through 23. Now this is standard church theology. Time we get to Ephesians. We're long past this whole thing of book of Acts. Long past the book of Acts. We're into really good, solid church theology. He says in verse 20, when he brought about what he brought, which he brought about in Christ, it, this whole big subject, I, I hate jumping in the middle like this. He brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead, seated him at the right hand of God in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which he, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about the depth of church age doctrine. And it's all based on this whole thing I've just put on the board for you. All of that is based on this. All this is great church theology, all based on what I just put on the board. You know, when we talk about Hebrews 10, 25, forsake not your assembling of yourselves together. That has such so far wide meaning beyond what you think it is. I've laid up here this whole deal of where the concept of assembly came from. There's a whole study in itself just about that. Jesus' baptism of the Holy Spirit incorporated into one body a racially mixed group of Jewish age believers into the one body of Christ the church. And when I say Jewish age, I'm talking about people, I'm talking about the dispensation. That's a phenomenal idea. I mean, how do you think all this stuff came into being? When you compare, did I, did I write this on your paper? Galatians 3, 26 through 29. Did I write 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 27? No. I, I put uh, 1 Corinthians 12 and 13. Oh, no, verse 13. I, well, put somewhere on that same point, put uh, 12 through 27, because he goes into the discussion of the one body, and now he's talking about, listen, he's, he's not talking about the universal church. He's talking about, the, the community, the local church, when he talks about, see, he t up here we're talking about the one body, in the, the one body, the church in the world. That's in this dispens the, the, this whole transition period. But when we get to 1 Corinthians 12, and we're into 12 through 27, we're talking about the one body. He's talking about the local church that has been gifted, and some are eyes, and some are ears, and some are legs, and some are arms. He's talking about spiritual gifts. Another one of the eight things that you receive at salvation is a spiritual gift. Every, every church age believer has been spiritually gifted with a ministry. If you stay with me a year, I'll teach it to you. You've got to stay with me a year. Look, I'm flying by the seat of my pants right now, and I feel bad that I'm, I'm pushing so much information out on you. But I'm trying to give you a panoramic view so that you can get an overview of something that's gigantic. Once the church was incorporated into the world, once it's incorporated into the world, then this, his deal with baptism is done just like John the Baptist, was water baptism was done when he baptized Jesus. Once the church is incorporated, the Jesus baptized the Holy Spirit is removed, and now everything is run off from the work of the Holy Spirit. The whole church age ministry is off from the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the functional life of a believer. He will guide you. He will direct you. He will lead you. He will indwell you, teach you, blah, 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 blah. 
Yeah. Look. Here's one in Romans. Romans, the sixth chapter, verses three and four. Actually, it starts with verse 3. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? We call that retroactive positional truth. Therefore, we have, been we have been buried with him through baptism into death in order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. What does that mean? Well, it's the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit producing, the Holy Spirit producing the divine nature of God and his work in our life. <laughs> the Holy Spirit has the characteristics of God. He's the third member of the Godhead. Look, where do I get the power to walk in the spirit? Where do I get the power over sin? Where do I get the power? Where do I get the power? You have omnipotent power within you through, th through limited, through the word of God. For you do not know that all of you have been baptized in Christ, been baptized to a death. Uh, therefore, we've been buried with him through baptism into death in order that as Christ was raised, so we had death burial as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the father. So we too might walk. Now, so how was he raised from the dead? Romans 8, 11 is tells us by the Holy Spirit. That spirit lives inside our mortal body to bring God's life actively engaged in us. And we are to walk it out. What's called walking it out in the newness of life. Listen, how much, look, look, here's your, here's your test. How much is your life being lived out in the old walk as opposed to the new walk? We ought to be walking in newness of life, right? Because the life that has been put in us has been put in us by the Holy Spirit of God. He will bring life to your mortal body. You should walk in the newness of that life. And if you walk in the oldness, there is identity. It's called carnality. You're walking in your flesh, not in spirit to spirit life. That's it for me. I'm going to tell you. It's a powerful study I just put, I just put on you. That's a powerful study. It will open the book of Acts up to your life. Okay. It'll open the book of Acts up. You'll look at the book of Acts in a completely different look. It's volume two of volume one. That's why it's important. He said, I'm going to finish out volume two off from volume one. I gave you volume one. Now I'm going to give you volume two. You need to pay attention to it because that's where we live. We live off from volume two. Let's have word for him. I know, Father, people would think, I've never heard this before. I, I don't know, Father. I, I can't explain why people have not heard it before. I can only explain they've heard it now. And I pray, Father, this, this is not a subject matter. Because there's so much misinformation, this is not a subject matter that can be learned in one setting. It at least takes three. You got to study it and study it and study it and study it. And then it begins, you begin to see the pieces fall together if you'll look at it the way it was laid out, really laid out simply, Father, by Luke in the book of Acts. He carried the subject over of Christ, now resurrected and ascended and seated at the right hand of God the Father. And he tells you in the ver very first chapter, verse 5, it is to fulfill this part called Jesus baptizing with the Holy Spirit. May we, we be good students, Father. May we pay attention to the Holy Spirit instructing us. May we understand the dynamics of the results of this is we the church. 
we are the church, not only connected universally, but connected locally. Gifted for great ministry. I pray we would be that kind of a people. Who understand the need and importance to God's program to walk in newness of life daily. Continuously. We've been empowered to do it by grace and I pray we would do it in Jesus name. Amen.